Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In today's episode, we discuss research and development, also known as R&D, as a way to create an innovative product. According to a study conducted by McKinsey & Company, a worldwide management consulting firm founded in 1926, although most executives agree that innovation is critical for business, 84% of those executives said innovation is important for growth strategy, and 80% said business models are at risk without innovation. But only 6% of those executives are satisfied with the innovative performance. Why? Because very few people know what exactly the problem is and how to improve in innovation and R&D. Before starting research and development, it is important to develop a clear innovative strategy that meets business growth targets and strategic objectives. How can this be done? Now I'm speaking verbatim from McKinsey & Company. It is by helping clients understanding the gap between actual and aspirational performance that innovative needs to fill. Then set financial targets related to innovation, the matrix required to measure performance, and the strategic areas on which to focus investments. A great example of this really is the next episode in Painter Golf, where the co-founder highlights an issue that was overlooked in the golfing industry, innovative footwear. Before you enjoy this next episode, I would like to give thanks to my sponsor, Modern Ally. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the businesses for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community, education, and social rights. The best part? Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and work to create custom packages and services to fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, impersonal, and out-of-touch agencies, and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com, or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. has over 30 years of experience in footwear design for brands FootJoy, Reebok, Nike, and Koan. He has numerous golf footwear patents and drives innovation and has designed shoes for Greg Norman, Tiger Woods, and Jordan Spieth. He is the co-founder of Painter Golf. Please welcome Mike Forsey. Mike, how are you doing, my good man? I'm good. Yes, all good here. Man, thank excited you to be on the show. Yeah, no, thank you again for uh, for joining me this evening. Uh, I'm very excited because uh, you know what you're doing. I'm a big sneakerhead, and so what you've been doing is as far as your career path goes and what you're currently doing. I'm very excited about. But first, uh, let's introduce the world to Mike. Who is Mike? So Mike is a um, guy that born and raised on the East Coast, just a little bit north of Boston. The only thing I've ever wanted to do. And I've had the opportunity to do it uh, my entire life is be in the footwear business. Um, so I went to school um, at a small little college called Suffolk University in Boston. I graduated on a Sunday and I went to work for my first brand, Spot Built and Saucony, on Monday. I worked there as um, what we called in the, in the day a tech rep. And I had from the Keys in Florida up to Bangor, Maine, and over to the Mississippi River. So we had three nationwide tech reps, and I was one of them. And we would call on aerobic studios and running facilities, and you know we would do any running events like the New York Marathon and Boston Marathon, et cetera. Then I got uh, the opportunity to go to work for FootJoy. Went to work for FootJoy just south of Boston in a town called Brockton, Mass. Um, work there in development. Uh, by the time I left FootJoy, I spent a little over three years there. By the time I left there and went to Reebok Golf, I was doing product development or product creation, and I would work with uh, our factories overseas. And then I did the same thing at Reebok Golf 
I took on the responsibilities of line management as well as product development. So you kind of got to see, you know, how to create the product, but also, you know, who you're creating the product for, what are the needs of the golfer, the athlete, um, how do you incorporate those into a product brief, how do you create a point of difference in the marketplace, um, and then you have to go off and work with your design team and work with your factory partners and create that. And then I got the opportunity to come out to the Pacific Northwest and I came to work for Nike Golf. I took on a, a little bit more responsibility. I I was in charge of all things golf footwear product creation and then got golf bag, golf gloves. I ran the golf licensing um, area as well and worked at Nike for 13 years. And then my last three years at Nike, I worked for a subsidiary of Nike called Kohan. And for Kohan, we actually sat on the Nike campus, but we created product with Nike technology for Kohan. So Nike Air technology, Lunar technology, Flywire, anything that had a Nike technology, but in a Kohan crafted leather product. Um, And then Nike told us that, yeah, we're going to go ahead and sell Kohan. And, um, you know, we got, we were given the opportunity to look for opportunities elsewhere. And I actually um, decided to retire from Nike. They had that plan in place for us. So I did that. I started my own business, which I'm currently doing now. Um, and it's called 4C Group. About 18 months into our first assignment with our first client, Ping Golf, uh, Ping asked if I would come down there to Phoenix and work for them full time and set up strategic planning for soft goods. Uh, commuted down there from Portland, Oregon to Phoenix for three and a half years. Loved it. Loved every second of it. And then decided it was probably best that I spend more time at home and in more time with my family. So moved back up here to Portland. About six months after that, started here in Portland with Under Armour. And they had signed Jordan Spieth to a contract at the time. And while they had a, a prototype for him, there was no real commercial plan to take that golf footwear product to market. So I put that together, put the, the line together, the assortment for golf footwear, took it to market, spent four and a half years doing that, and then retired again until my wife said, no, nope, that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> I don't want to see you that much. <laughs> so... Um, So started chatting with David Painter, our co-founder with Painter Golf. He always wanted to get into golf footwear, and he convinced me to do it with him. So we founded this brand um, about 14 months ago, and we started shipping product the 1st of March of this year, and uh, it's been fun. And I've done way too much talking now. No, that's this. I'm like... I, I'm I'm I lost for words because that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so so we we know for for the for the listeners at home. So what Painter Golf is 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 a golf company, which actually one of the products they make are some golf shoes, which I actually own. I, I purchased a pair of golf shoes, and let me tell you, those things are phenomenal. <laughs> it's like Excellent. walking on air. It's great. But what other Excellent. what other than golf shoes? What does uh, Painter Golf do? So we also do a performance golf glove. We have a collaboration with a headwear company called FlexFit. We do headwear with them, a variety of styles there. And then we also do a performance sock. One of the kind of guiding principles at Painter Golf is if we can bring a performance advantage to the golfer, we'll bring that product to market, kind of what we started in golf footwear. Um, If we can do that in other product types, be that apparel or, you know, golf bag or other areas that are specific to golf. We feel like to stay true to who we are, we want to make sure that we're able to deliver golfers a true performance advantage. It's better than anything that's out there. So that's that, that was kind of the uh, original creation for Painter, it sounds like, right? To, to kind exactly. Of- and that's why 
And that's what attracted me to the painter brand initially. So the painter brand is a a technical footwear brand uh, founded by David Painter. And David had always had plans to move into other categories. So that was training or running or other cleated footwear. He always had a vision to expand. And his customers began to ask him, hey, why don't you get into golf footwear? Your, your product is very similar. It's a lateral sport. You know, why don't you get into golf? And, and David didn't know anything about golf footwear. So he and I hooked up about, I want to say, two and a half years ago on LinkedIn. And I saw his brand and his brand mark and his marketing tagline, which was performance multiplied. I immediately was interested in his brand and what he was doing. It was a brand that was authentic. It was a brand that I felt I was part of it, like it was welcoming and open. And and the mark is comes from the tagline performance multiplied. It is a stylized multiplication sign. So it's this X mark. It's really cool. And it goes with a lot of things um, on product. It's very simple. It's very clean, iconic. You know, anything that we have brought to market so far has been about Hey, how do you deliver on that performance multiplied mantra? Like, how do you bring something that's unique and different to the market? Especially since, you know, we've been making golf footwear as a society for, you know, 70 plus years. You know, there's a whole lot of brands that are in this space. So how do we bring that performance advantage and that point of difference to a pretty crowded marketplace? Yeah. And you know, one of the things you actually highlighted kind of indirectly, which is kind of interesting is I think we talk a lot about on this show about brand and brand building and brand awareness, but we kind of talk about it from a consumer perspective, right? And consumer focuses on a brand and it's interesting to kind of hear, you know, cause it's also important as an employee or, or, or even a co-founder of a, of, of a brand, having that gut feeling of inclusiveness or feeling a part of the brand, right? Yep, exactly. Well, you know, a brand, it only exists in the consumer's mind. You know, it's not, there's nothing tangible about it. There's goodwill there. There's reputation. There's kind of a feeling you get with a brand, but it's not something that you can put your arms around. It develops from kind of out of nowhere. It develops from multiple different areas, whether that's your brand experience or your product experience or you know, what the brand does in marketing or the kind of athletes that it associates with, even like your social media, what you're doing in your communication, it all contributes to how a customer is going to connect or a golfer in our case, how they're going to connect to your brand. Um, So it's, um, you know, starting from nothing, we really had to think through that and who we wanted to be and what kind of experience we wanted to deliver to golfers. So one of the things you've talked about, right, is the performance and improvement uh, of the golfers. How do you do that by making a golf shoe? That's a really good question. And it's something that if you look at, you know, golf is played in foursomes and, you know, golf is played in all kinds of weather conditions. It's as much about the golf swing as it is about walking the course and walking the course for four and a half, maybe five hours. Golf footwear is kind of the ultimate balance between taking care of the biomechanical needs of and the on-course needs of the golfer. But golfers also care about how their product looks, much about the aesthetic and the fashion piece of it as it is about the performance piece of it. But when we looked at the market, we felt like the pendulum had swung too far to the fashion side of the business. And for Painter Golf, what we think about is that, you know, golf footwear, it's your only connection to the ground, just like your, you know, your your hand is the only connection to the club. And, and if you look at the modern golf swing, the modern golf swing is about athletes or golfers that use the ground as leverage. So you push into the ground and you get that back in energy return. And anything that you do, it's Newton's third law, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if you push into the ground, you get that back in responsiveness and energy return and power that the golfer can bring to the ball and in their golf swing. 
so when you study the biomechanical movements or the natural motion of the golf swing, there's certain things that you can design into golf footwear that will give that consumer, that golfer, a performance advantage. Um, but you can't forget about the aesthetic either. There needs to be this balance because, you know, nobody wants to show up on the first tee and have your buddies give you a hard time because you've got something that is foreign on your feet or something that's not as aesthetic pleasing. So there's a balance there, but we wanted to start with kind of the performance and delivering on a performance advantage and then make sure that it was aesthetically where it needs to be at the same time. Nice. Now, so, so for the listeners at home, could you generally summarize the various stages of producing an actual golf shoe? I think that would actually be something a lot of people just don't really know about what all goes into actually creating a shoe in general, but more importantly, yeah. what are those stages of the production process? Sure. It probably takes companies between 14 to 18 months from product inception to delivery to retail. Wow. And product inception would be, you know, you're discussing a product, you want to discuss a market, you want to discuss a point of difference, you want to brief the product so that you're uniquely different than your competition. That goes without saying that you need to analyze what's going on in the market, uh, where your opportunity is, who's your competition, how do you differentiate yourself, and that goes into your product brief. And in my experience, it's always been best to have a product brief that between design, development, and your line manager is an agreement. It's not a handoff. And what I mean by that is that you all agree to whatever you put down on paper, that's what we're going to bring to market. So it's not the product line manager who writes a brief, here's the price point, here's our competition, here are the features and benefits that we want in the product. And then they hand it off to design, design sketches on it. They hand it off to development, development goes and works with the factory. So in my experience, it's been that that product brief is an agreement between those three legs uh, on a stool, that line management, design, and development. So then once you have that, that brief, you'll put together what we would call a bomb or bill of materials, and your designer would take you know, probably a month or two doing initial sketches. Everyone comes back together again. You might do an, a second sketch. You might refine your sketch, and then that goes to your factory partner in Asia. What you do in the bomb is you also you specify what materials you want to use, what last you want to use. The last would obviously be the shoe form that you know your your product is built around. Every item down to you know the shoelace, aglet, the uh, eyelet, you name it. It has to go on a bomb so they know exactly. They know visually based on the sketch or based on the, the line art, what you want to deliver, but then they also need to know physically what or what materials you want in your product. You'll do a couple of rounds of samples. Initially, the factory will do a sample or what we call a pullover. They'll send you images of that. They'll send that to us. We'll um, make revisions if necessary. That goes back to them. At the same time, you're doing for outsole, you're doing 2D or two-dimensional drawings of your outsole. And two-dimensional drawings would include cross-section, would include um, thicknesses, materials, differences in materials. And then you'd move to three-dimensional or 3D. From a 3D phase, you would either create a, a digital file that you could print a rapid prototype, or you could do what we'd call a wood model and from that file, you can create a three-dimensional representation of what you've confirmed in 2D. And then pullover that we talked about, that goes on a prototype outsole. And then you look at revisions again. Does the upper match the outsole, midsole, et cetera? And then you'll do a first-round sample. Um, you'll get some what we call wear test and fit test. And then as long as wear testing, which in golf normally takes between three and five months, you know, you want to have a durable product. You want it to be waterproof and weatherproof. You're playing in all kinds of conditions. So 
you know, whatever materials you're using, take a beating in golf footwear. And then you can confirm the product. You'd order salesman samples, product line manager samples for photography and catalog, social. And then six months in advance of delivery, delivery to um, retail, you would place a production PO. Factory would then take what we develop in a size nine and grade it out. Whatever your size run is, we happen to go down to a size eight and up to a size 13. Um, We do a medium and a wide width. All that the factory is grading or setting up production tooling for you to commercialize the product and bring that product to retail. Uh, At the same time, they're ordering materials for production. And you set up a production line, which um, normally takes about a month from cutting and sewing down to final assembly. And then if you are going by sea freight, it normally takes about a month to get here from Asia. You could fly some product in and that takes about two weeks. Get it into the warehouse probably two weeks before you're delivering it to retail, fulfilling orders. And then if it's direct to consumer, if you have your own website, that goes live or you ship the product to your wholesale account. So all that takes between 14 and 18 months, depending on how quickly you go from inception through to um, retail. Was that too much information or? No, that was incredible. And I think that's so important because again, this, this podcast is geared towards educating, right? And, and I want the individuals at home that are listening, you know, if this is something they're interested in doing, I just want to make sure that they know, this is the process that it goes through, right? It's not about just writing, drawing a shoe on a piece of paper and then handing it off to somebody and then going from there. There There's so many different steps, right? But more importantly, there really are. How many times did your team have to pivot? We call it development for a reason. We don't call it confirmation. So (laughs) there are, so what you start out with as a vision or as a, a brief may not necessarily be what you end up with. Because if we called it confirmation, you would you'd probably never get to market if you if you weren't open, if you weren't flexible, if you weren't if you didn't have the ability to pivot from, hey, you know what, that doesn't work. But what if we went to another material, or you know that price point doesn't work? Could we put more into the product so that we could get more, uh, you know, in wholesale or retail prices? You have to stay nimble. And again, I mean, you're, you're talking about 14, 18 months uh, development calendar. So you've got about, you know, 12 months of those decisions that and revision after revision, your plan may change. So you have to be open to that. Yeah. Now, this is a new venture, right? 16 yep. months, you said, right? Now, have you felt at any point in time, you know, any self-doubt in this current venture? And if not, have you ever felt any self-doubt in a previous venture? I mean, you always have self-doubt, but think if you bring to market what feels right and what is consistent with what your initial vision was, I don't know if, I, I think you can, I think you can take that self-doubt away. Like we were like from sample one on, on painter golf vision, we knew we, we had it right. And, you know, when we first brought it out to show golfers, we knew we had something. And now that we've, you know, delivered it to retail, we gotten confirmation that we've gotten it right. And, you know, uh, we've got not only account, but territory or sales managers, sales reps reaching out to us. We have PGA, Corn Ferry. Um, European tour players reaching out to us. Um, wow. We're going to sign an exclusive and official footwear deal with the David Ledbetter Academy. And that'll be announced in the next five days or so. So David Ledbetter has 40 teaching academies worldwide. And some of the things that are fundamental in his teaching philosophy is using the ground as leverage. So when he saw our product, he's like, wait, wait, this is so consistent and seems like a natural fit. So we're going to have it on 150 of his instructors, 30 of his best students. So we're going to have reach as far as South Korea, Indonesia, South Africa, the UK, British Columbia, and then here in the US. You know, you kind of of look for when you're developing a brand, you look for those moments of authenticity. And this is one of those times when they initially contacted us 
the conversation was so natural as far as, hey, we can fit together because what you're doing at Painter Golf is exactly what we believe at David Ledbetter. You know, you get confirmation when better players start wearing your product and like it. Mm, yeah. You know, when retailers look at your product, go, hey, you got something here. But hey, you always have that. You know, you, you roll the dice sometimes. When you're doing development, you roll the dice. I mean, every step of the way. It's, like I said before, it's development. It's not confirmation. It's not we're going to market with this. It's, it develops over time. So, yeah. you know, um, there's going to be certain times that you're like, oh, are we going forward with this? Is this is this right? Does it feel right? Does it look right? Yeah, it's a good question, though. Really good question. And that's, that's kind of entrepreneurship, right? Is just managing risk. Right. Exactly. I've got 30 plus years experience doing this. And, you know, I, I, and I say this to my children who are now 30 and 28, you pick a vocation that you're passionate about, that you're not going to be motivated to get out of bed in the morning because of what's in your paycheck. You're going to be motivated by what's in your heart, what you're passionate about, what you are. Hey, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I've had an amazing life because I've followed that. You know, I, I have had that passion. I really like what I'm doing and I've liked what I've been doing for 30 plus years. If there's any words of advice that I can give the listeners that pick something that you feel like you'd be passionate about whether someone was going to pay you to do it or not. So. Yeah. That's great advice for the listeners at home. You know, you said you've been doing this for 30 some odd years. What is something you wish you would have learned, you know, starting that maybe you wish you would have known before? If I could give my younger self if some you, advice, it, you was, give your it would be, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it would be, you don't know what you don't know. Be open to learning, be open to receiving information. You know, just because you graduate from college doesn't mean your learning is over. It's just the beginning. You know, you learn it. Every day on the job, you learn at every experience that you have. I've had the opportunity to travel the world for my work. You learn by being, you know, introduced to different cultures and different personalities. And if I knew as a 22 year old what I know now, I'm not sure I would have experienced the journey as much as, you know, I have. There's a lot out there that you can learn and that you can experience and that you can just enjoy. And, and enjoying it is, is key. It Definitely. really is. Definitely. Now, looking back on everything, would you do it all again? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for the folks yeah, at home, how can, how can they buy themselves some painter shoes? You can go to paintergolf.com. It's all on there. Everything is in stock. And if there's anything that you need from me, that you can reach out to our customer care at paintergolf.com. And we look at that every day. You can also reach out to us via our social on Instagram, which is Painter Golf. You know, Facebook is Painter Golf. You know, we've got all the social media platforms covered. One of the things we said from the beginning is we want our golfer, our customer, to have an equally good product experience as they have a brand experience. So if the customer is not happy with our product, we want to make it right. If the you know, the customer's not happy with the experience that they have with our brand. We want to make that right as well. So, Man, incredible. I'm excited. Mike Forsey, the co-founder of Painter Golf. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.